my story kind of starts in 2017, early 2017. I was a bigger person um, and I wanted to make a change. So I started thinking about getting into fitness and then ultimately participating in a fitness competition. At the time, I worked at a fashion company where I would have to work by coastally. So I had a lot going on. I was constantly moving. I was constantly traveling. And I was going from New York to California, working out, trying to get this together. And then I seriously started to consider competing. So if anybody has ever thought about doing a fitness competition or anything, you know that prep is consuming of your entire life. But I'll explain later how this was so beneficial in my PRE journey. Um, before my diagnosis, this was around May 2017, I was in Cali and I was preparing for a meeting in my hotel room. I sneezed and got shooting pain down my arm. My face went numb down my back. And I immediately thought, well, this is old age. I am turning 30 in a couple in a year and 30 and sneezing. This is what happens. It's awful. I'm, I'm breaking now. This is the decline. And I was like, just, I just thought that this is what it was going to be. Um, and I powered through. I had a meeting to prepare for, so, uh, and I have a pretty, I like to think that I have a pretty high pain tolerance, and that pain terrified me, terrified me. I was brought to my knees, and uh, honestly, even thinking about it now, like, creates so much anxiety, because it was so painful, and it was shooting down my arm, down my back, down my leg. Um, I got up, I said, well, got to keep going. I did my, I uh, went to my meeting and push forward. And then I pushed forward for a couple months after that. But I did notice that I had some symptoms that were increasing in frequency and in severity. Again, I thought, A, you're getting old. You got to learn to cope with that lady. Uh, B, I had a lot of anxiety because I was prepping for a show. Um, and then my work schedule was crazy. So I thought, that these symptoms that I was experiencing was in relation to how my anxiety was manifesting itself uh, physically. And so some of my symptoms were blurred vision, intense pressure behind my eyes, numbness on the right side of my body. Um, it was mostly concentrated though in my face and in the back of my head and the numbness was really bad in my hands. Um, I had nausea, periods of nausea, dizziness, headaches. Uh, I had a lot of difficulty attending and processing. So conversations were becoming difficult for me. Um, but again, I thought that this was anxiety. I thought that this was, and uh, I thought that this was just how I, I was getting through this really hectic period of my life. Now we fast forward to June, so maybe about a month after that, and with these symptoms be increasing, I went to lunch with my mom, and in the middle of the conversation, I just felt like I just wasn't there anymore. Like I just, I, I wasn't there anymore. Everything started moving in slow motion, and I, I, rem I remember, like if I was still sitting in that spot, I started to feel weird, so I kind of glanced up at the sky like, oh, you know? And I looked and the clouds were kind of swirling in, uh, the sky was getting gray, the wind was picking up and a storm was definitely coming. And then all at once, I could feel nothing and everything. I tried to describe this to my mom as I was sitting there with her, cause this was like happening right in front of her. And she's like, are you okay? And um, I'm trying to explain to her, but how do you describe a pain that you know the other person has never experienced. It's not like a stomach ache. We've all had stomach aches. So, and we're taught when we're young, oh, this is what a stomach ache is. You know, this is what a headache is. How do I explain to you that I'm here, but I'm not here? I can't feel anything, but I feel everything. So I just felt like I was being electrocuted. Um, I immediately got up and I said, I just have, I have to go. I'm gonna go lay down. I went home. I tried to get to sleep and uh, into the night, the symptoms just got so much worse. That numbing was what it was like at maybe 45, 50% numbing sensation was full blown hundred. I couldn't feel any touch. 
my whole face was itchy. The back of my head was like itchy and um, I was totally numb on the right side of my body. It was almost as if I was paralyzed. I was terrified, freaked out, called my mom who lived in Hawaii at the time. She said, go to the emergency room. My partner uh, got me in a cab right away and we went to Northwell Hospital in Forest Hills in Queens where I lived at the time. Now, upon entering and the, um, I guess, um, the intake nurse, she asked me what my symptoms were. I explained to her, I'm numb. I am having some trouble breathing. Um, I'm itchy and my whole face is numb. My back is numb. She goes, well, super casual, by the way. Well, it sounds like you have either had a stroke or an allergic reaction. I was just like, okay. Um, and so she suggested that I get a C scan. So as soon as they performed, I, I waited around with these horrible, terrifying symptoms in the emergency room for what seemed like forever. And then I eventually got uh, my C scan. They put me in a corner in the emergency room. It wasn't in a room or anything. It was just, they just put me off in a corner and I was just waiting for my results. Some doctor that I had never met before walks right up to me, hands me my discharge papers and goes, oh, we got your results from your C scan. Uh, you have KRE malformation. You'll have to see a specialist. There's nothing we can do for you here. Thanks. And they pretty much just hand me my discharge paper and was like, bye. Um, thankfully, I had been on the phone FaceTiming with my mom the entire time. And she, as soon as he said, you have KRE malformation, I heard her go. <gasps> and even at that time, it didn't click to me. This is like the plot twist. My mom actually has KRE malformation as well. It, I never thought, it just, it didn't connect with me. Um, my mom, since she has, we don't live together. And again, we were talking about that older generation who they don't really show their pain. They don't really discuss their pain. So there wasn't much of a discussion. I didn't ever get the chance to experience my mother's struggle with Kiari. So I never, ever connected that maybe that struggle would one day be mine. So when she said it in that moment, I was like, thank God. Because had she not been on the phone with me and had I not known or been a little, at least heard the word before, I would have freaked out. I would have freaked out. But she calmed me down, talked me down. And uh, the next day we went searching for a specialist. Um, my partner did a ton of research looking for specialists in the area. And then we had to look for this, a specialist that we wanted to work with that also accepted our insurance. Um, and this was in August. Yeah, this was in August. Now, I called over and over again. Nobody got back to me. Um, I was in the dark for about a month. Then uh, once the specialist did get back to me to schedule um, an appointment, oh no, wasn't even to schedule an appointment. They just got back to me and, they, and it was a neurologist, neurosurgeon. He said, well, we can't see you unless you've gotten an MRI. So I won't even make an appointment with you unless you get an MRI of your brain and your spine. And so I had to then go back to my PCP, explain to her that I need a brain. And she's like, well, why? Why do you need an MRI? I'm like, lady, because I have Chiari malformation. He's not going to see me. We're not going to get any treatment unless he can, we can see what he's dealing with, right? And so I eventually got that referral. That took some time, but you know, I've heard some other stories and apparently it takes a lot. It's taken a lot longer. So I'm actually quite blessed because it only took me about a month to get my MRI and to get my scans back and then send them off to him. In, a, in a later, late September, he finally accepted an appointment. I went to see him. Uh, he explained to me that I had Chiari malformation as I already knew and that I also have syringeal myelia. Um, and that my syrinx was in a very dangerous place in my C-spine and that he, he was shocked that I was even able to stand. He said, I don't know how you're standing in front of me. I don't know how you work out. I really don't know how you're functioning right now because you need emergency surgery. Of course, when that happened, um, I was with my mom and my grandma. My partner was there. Everybody freaked out. I like, oh my God. And I'm just like, everybody calm down. So we decided to go and get a second opinion and we scheduled. And since I already had my MRI, I didn't have to wait for that. So I was able to get an, uh, get an appointment really quickly with Dr. Greenfield um, in Wild Cornell. 
and that's in Manhattan. Uh, and when I saw him, really cool, suave dude, um, he goes to me, yeah, you know, you're gonna need surgery and yeah, your syrinx is in a real dangerous place. So it is emergency surgery. Um, we're gonna, and uh, he also explained to me that without the surgery, um, the nerve damage would, there would be permanent, there'd be, um, it would be irreversible. And that I, there was a strong possibility that I would lose all function of my leg. So surgery, my decompression surgery was scheduled for November 9th of 2017. So all of this, my life pretty much changed between May of 2017 to October 2017. Um, I'm going to now share my screen because I am going to show you pretty much what my life kind of looked like uh, from that point forward in pictures. So that was the day that we were driving over to see Dr. Greenfield. That is my niece. She is my ride or die and my best friend. And she's been there from the very beginning to the end. She knows everything about me and um, her support. And it's, it's funny because someone so small who knows so little can be like your biggest cheerleader and your biggest support. So it, it was important for me to include her in that. So uh, she, she even went to the, to, to the uh, appointment with me uh, that day. Uh, and she was there when they let me know that I needed surgery. Um, go to the next picture. So remember how I said everybody freaked out because they realized I had to have brain surgery? My remedy for that was taking them to a bar in St. Mark's. <laughs> and that's how we celebrated the next leg the, of my journey. And so there's my sister, who's the mother of the munchkin. And that's my partner and my best friend. And, you know, as difficult as it was to get that information, again, I was just so happy to have that kind of support around me. Like, I don't, all I remember was how much fun we had that night. That was surgery day. Um, again, I'm showing you pictures because there's not much I remember after I was uh, scheduled for surgery and when I had and surgery day. But all I remember was really stressful. It came and it went. Uh, I had a beautiful view of the Hudson River and the nurses at Wow Cornell took such good care of me. I was totally comfortable. Um, it's funny because as I know it was traumatic because I don't remember everything, but what I do remember is that I had a blast. Like I woke up from surgery smiling and my nurses were so awesome. And um, I was very, very uh, happy that I had that experience. Uh, now I was super shocked when I had to be discharged and told that I had to take care of myself because I had such a good time with them. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it was it was tough being discharged. I felt that I wasn't ready to go home, uh, but I knew that it was time to take ownership over my recovery and and to really get going. So this is me home. That's my scar. Oh, by the way, so my hair was this big before the surgery, and I had shaved it all off. But if I was going to be bald, I was going to be bald in style. So I, I, I dyed my hair platinum before, and there is a very clear, and I'm happy that I did that because I can, I now have the journey of my scar. And so there it is. That's my partner. Very important that I included that. <laughs> um, okay, so a couple days after surgery, I'm sorry, after being discharged, I knew that I had to test my limits and take control of my life, which probably wasn't the safest thing in the world, um, but I decided that it was what I was going to do, and I was going to test my limits. I was um, apprehensive about how much activity I was going to do, as my neurosurgeon told me that I was, it was not a good idea to lift anything heavier than 30 pounds, and that I was not going to be able to lift anything over 30 pounds. So I said, no, nah, I don't accept that. So immediately after I got out two days post being discharged, I took my dogs for a walk. And that is how I started my fitness journey with uh, post-op with Kiari. So I would take walks in the park. Um, it started with, you know, slow walks. I increased the speed to a little, a little bit of a light jog. And then my light jog kind of turned into, uh, my light jog kind of turned into, um, low impact exercises, doing what I can at, in the park usually. And, and that's pretty much how that part of coping with Kiari came about.
Unfortunately, though, I did get a CSF leak and had to go back to the hospital in November. And that is what it looked like. Um, and my incision was also doing terribly as it would ooze this really unpleasant um, pus. And uh, I had to go back to the hospital immediately. And I stayed there over Thanksgiving, which was fine because I'm a vegan anyway. So turkey means nothing. And I was just like, okay, back to the hospital. And that's where I was for Thanksgiving. When I got back home, I realized that I had to make it to stage. This was not going to be the determining factor of how the rest of my recovery was gonna look. And it was not gonna get in the way of any of my goals. So I started this journey preparing for my fitness competition. And I decided in that moment right there that I was going to get on stage before the year was over. So back to my low impact uh, workouts in the park. Um, and you see, it was, it, it was tough, uh, but, but it was necessary. And um, I worked out in the park slowly until I felt comfortable enough to perform new exercises and um, even yoga. I loved yoga. Yoga changed so much for me before diagnosis, just with coping. Because for so, such a long time, I thought that these symptoms were manifesting themselves um, because of anxiety, because I couldn't cope, because I was super emotional. At one point, I was even diagnosed bipolar. So yoga was something that I really used to cope with all of those things. And so when I was able to return back to that after surgery, it was, it, it was just a really important moment for me. Um, and so once I decided to do yoga, I said, okay, Shanti, I'm ready for you. And so I decided to start the Insanity program to help me to get my weight back down and get me ready to prepare for show. And so back to the park I went <laughs> to do some more low impact exercises at the park. I incorporated um, some HIIT, so high intensity interval. But what I would have to do is modify them because if I were to do a lot of jumping or moving from high to low, it was a major trigger for my symptoms. So what I did was I took what I learned from insanity and I modified the workouts. That is how I continue to this day to cope. It's never a no, I can't do that. It's always a, I'm going to do it. I'm just going to do it my way. So um, that's just how I continued. I had my follow-up visit uh, with Dr. Greenfield and he was elated to tell me that I was 90 that my syrinx had shrunk and that I was 95 percent recovered so if you look at that white portion on the left side that big blob <laughs> in the middle of my spine that was the size of my syrinx only four weeks after surgery it did it shrink to what you see on the right side of your your screen so it was a re the surgery was successful I was 95 percent improved I had been working out despite being told, and I'm not saying to do it, but despite being told not to do it, I, I worked out and I still was able to get these kinds of results. So that only empowered me to continue with my fitness journey and really solidified the idea that I was going to make it to stage. So kept working out and if you, and then I eventually got to a place where I was comfortable enough working out um, in the gym. So I had moved from the park to home, to now comfortable working out in the gym. At this point, I had also returned back to work after being off of work for about six months. And there I am at yoga again. It did not leave my regimen or my routine. And to this day, I still do yoga every single morning. And we're working out again, because that's what life looks like when you're on prep. All you do is eat and work out and then sleep. Um, and But through everything, my um, symptoms were not even though I had uh, my syrinx had shrunk, I was still experiencing all of the same symptoms. If anything, they were a little bit more severe. And so at that point, I was at symptoms. And so they had let me, they had referred me to a pain management doctor who prescribed me gabapentin. And at the time, it was a lifesaver because at first, it really did help my symptoms. It eased the nerve pain. I was able to sleep through the night which had it happened 
for this entire year because the nerve pain was so bad at night. Um, and so uh, I was prescribed gabapentin, but the gabapentin, but my, my symptoms still were ongoing. So every time I expressed that my symptoms were bad, the only treatment option they give, gave me was to increase the gabapentin. And at one point, and we were just, we, I was at such a high dose of gabapentin and there was just nothing, like they had no other options for me. So what they were doing, they were injecting a nerve blocker in my, I'm not gonna say this right, so bear with me, occipital, occipox. Yeah, okay, all right. I'm not gonna say it again because I'm gonna butcher it again. But that, they were injecting me with this blue goo that was a nerve blocker and um, it was awful. Um, but it had to be done. And honestly, it was a waste of time. I kind of felt like a guinea pig because all they would do was keep uh, prescribing me higher dosages of gabapentin and then injecting the back of my head with stuff. And I was just like, this is whack. Um, it's not working. My symptoms are getting worse. Um, so at that point, I decided that I was done with gabapentin and that I was going to start my own healing and look for holistic options. Um, and then I made it to stage. So that was the first, that was exactly one year after my surgery. And I was able to complete my goal of making it to stage. And I was so proud and it was so dope. And it was an amazing experience. And once I did it, I did it that time. I was just like, I'm gonna do it again. I gotta do it again. So um, I, <laughs> I went into a prep immediately after that. But unfortunately, my symptoms didn't get any better. Um, I was still super symptomatic, and if and if anything, at that point they were because I because prep is so hard on your body that coming off of prep and then also with the high dosages of gabapentin, my body totally rejected it. But that was me on stage. This was what happened uh, with gabapentin. Um, I became incredibly swollen. My legs were super swollen. My abdomen was incredibly swollen as well. And this is what my face ended up looking like at its worst. So my face blew up um, and I was just unrecognizable. And not only was the physical part of it really difficult for me, especially being that I am a competitor, that I am on stage. And this is where I started to learn, you have to listen to your body. And I feel like when you have Kiari, you have no choice but to listen to your body. Um, because your body's always speaking to you in one way or another. You get a pain for some reason, you know you were triggered by something, you go and you look for that trigger. Um, and so that was that. After this, I realized that um, I had to figure out my own ways of coping um, and my own ways of healing. Funny enough, it was through fitness. Fitness was the way that I learned how to cope and to manage my symptoms. Why? So when you're preparing for a show, you become so finely in tune with your body because you need to know what you're eating, what exercises you're doing, how they're affecting your body, what your body looks like, what was the cause of this. So, you know, you become in documenting my fitness and in prep, I was able to learn what my triggers were. And I was able to learn that I have to modify things. It's not that I'm limited I have, or that I can't do something. I just have to modify. So once I started to learn my triggers, it became easier to modify. And I modified every single workout. But I applied that to my life. Anything that seemed like it was too impossible to do or that I just couldn't do it, I was going to do it. I was going to get it done. Um, I, just had to make, I just had to do it my way. I just had to do it my way. Um, now along with prep is very obviously when you're doing fitness it's very nutrition nutrition based so you're very very conscious of the foods that you're eating and i realized that there was a direct correlation between the foods i was consuming and the severity and the frequency of my symptoms so i realized that when i consume mostly anti-inflammatory foods my symptoms are way less frequent, like they're way less spread apart. And I can almost more, e because they're so far apart, I can easily identify what the trigger was and then how to manage. Um, but the anti-inflammatory foods was a game changer. So diet was the biggest thing. I also downloaded an app called Curable, 
which was immensely helpful. So this app breaks down what pain is and that it's just your brain's response to, it's your brain's way of telling you that you had experienced trauma before. So don't do this again because you're going to hurt yourself again. You know what I'm saying? So that kind of helped me to cope with the pain while I was sitting in it. So I had to, because so I would think to myself, all right, yes, I feel this pain. Yes, I'm experiencing this pain, but this is just my brain telling me you did something or you're about to do something that might hurt you again. So let's figure it out. So again, instead of just sitting in that pain, how can I modify? How can I manage? And I don't think that that would have ever happened if I wasn't so, if I wasn't in prep. So again, just managing that meditation became it's a part of my daily regimen now and just having that moment to disconnect just it's it's life-changing and um i i i i don't know how other like it's it's such a lesson in acceptance learning yourself sitting with yourself and like letting go stop holding on to Oh, I'm going to be in pain or these are going to be my symptoms forever. Oh, you know, any, any doubt, there's no room for doubt in your brain when you have Chiari because our brains are huge. So you gotta, you gotta, you know, make sure that the space that you have there is filled with what is going to help you cope and manage. Um, I also consume CBD every day and sometimes it's in like the form of a tincture. Uh, most of the CBD I consume is tincture form. Um, I, on my bad pain days, I also do have THC. So I do a THC to CBD, um, uh, tincture that has CBD and THC in it. And on the bad pain days, it's a one-to-one -one ratio, meaning that there's the same amount of THC in it and CBD, but the CBD is what really helped me to manage my pain and cope with my pain. When I talk about diet, especially when I talk about diet with clients or just with anybody in general, you think anti-inflammatory foods and then you think, oh, once again, I'm limited. So I already have to deal with these things and now I'm limited with diet, blah, blah, blah. Not so, not so. Foods are awesome. There's a wide range, again, modification. We are not limited. We can do anything. I feel unstoppable. I, I feel like I, 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 I'm unafraid. And that's something that's so special to me about having Kiari. It's just like you, you find a strength that you didn't know existed. You didn't know it was there. And then when you do accomplish something, you realize how capable you are. And that all those times that you thought that you were dumb, that you were slow, that you were lazy, that you were stupid, that you were limited, you know, was actually you pushing through, persevering, growing, coping, modifying, making things work. You apply, I call us Kiari heads, you apply everything that you learn being a Kiari head to life and you realize that there is nothing that you can't do. Anything, everything is within your scope. Everything is a possibility. And I, again, I don't think I would have learned that if I hadn't been on prep and if I hadn't stuck to my um, fitness goals. So I had an interview the other day with um, the Kiari community on Instagram, which is another amazing platform because again, I was able to connect with so many people. And it's funny because our world is small and it's rare, but man, connecting with all you guys really makes the world feel big, but in a, in a good way. Like I don't feel alone. And um, so my way of giving back was just showing what you can do. So I created a series called the Kiari Can series, which is like low impact exercises that we can do through modification. And um, I remember what, having the conversation with um, the Kiari community and they had, um, I told them having Kiari is almost like being superhuman because although there are so many things that you feel like you can't do despite the pain, despite the symptoms, despite everything, you're still a functioning person. You're still out there doing the best that you can. And it's like, if anything, we're like X-Men. We're, we're, we're like, we can be in the adventures. Like, I feel like having Kiari comes with a cape. We're superhuman. We are not limited. Our possibilities are endless. And um, 
and yeah, I, I hope that my hope is that through fitness, I can encourage other people who, who share my journey uh, or who can connect with me. I want to be able to show them you can do anything, anything that you set your mind to. So that is my hope. I hope that I can just encourage people with my story and my journey.